The, the first show this morning is talking about some of the work we've been doing with uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders and gambling over the last 20 years or so. So this is a summary of some of that work. This is also a call to action for providers, advocates, nonprofit workers, legislators, and just citizens about what are we doing with this. How many folks here in this room, this is your very first Minnesota uh, gambling conference? That's amazing, about half of you. So give yourselves a round of applause. How many of you are actually working with clients and families right now, regardless of whether it's gambling or not? Just straight up mental health, addiction, you name it. Okay, so we have a wide variety of folks. So I have things here I think that are available for everybody, and it's a summary of some of the, again, some of the work that we've been doing here. All right, so really talking about some of the themes about cultural themes in AAPI communities that drive gambling and potentially drive the risk for gambling disorder. Number two, talk about things that you can do in your own community, in your own agency, in your own clinics, in your own wherever you work to say, how can I help do a better job of screening, assessment, and referrals? And then lastly, talk about for those of you who are working with clients, what can you actually do in the office or on the Zoom to actually do that. How many here are still doing telehealth more than 50% of your time? So it's a good chunk. So again, things that we do in person are a little bit different than things we do in telehealth, and I have strategies for both. Well, let's just start off with the case. I've been working with gamblers since the 90s. I finished residency in 2002, but I saw my first patient with gambling disorder, a first person with gambling disorder, right around the turn of the century, 1999. So I've been doing this for about a quarter century. Uh, and it's just the cases always stick with me. So here's an example of a case that revolves a lot around the issues that AAPI families and uh, gambling clients deal with. And this is Mary and John. They came to see me. This is way before the pandemic. We're going to saw like 2016, 2017, something like that. They actually came into my office after calling me. Now, again, when people call me, they're like, hey, I have a gambling problem. I heard you on the radio. I know you're a gambling expert. I need your help. I am the specialist. That is not the case for the vast majority of providers out there, right? You just got to drag it out of them. But they call me, they're like, hey, we want to come see you. Our dad's struggling with gambling. Like, Is your dad coming? No, it's just going to be us. So into the office rolls in Mary and John, two second generation Taiwanese American, a f couple years younger than myself, maybe about 10, 15 years younger than me, uh, raised in America, they're second generation, they know English, they barely speak uh, Chinese, they're highly educated. He said, our dad is a retired businessman, very successful, came to America, built up the you know, American dream, built up the ability to give a better life for us, middle class, but he did pretty well in business. But we're worried that now in his older years, he's just spending more and more time in the casino, more and more money at the casino. And our mother is greatly distressed about him going off, but won't quote, stand up to him or won't tell him how she really feels because of the position in the family. So their, their questions really are, it isn't just simply, how do we get our dad to stop? I think that's a much basic question that shouldn't be answered. It's much more of this stuff. What do we actually say to him? How do we get him professional help? We asked dad to come with us to see you, an Asian doctor. And he said, no way. I'm not seeing anybody like that. And so they were saying, we brought him in front of a culturally relevant physician. Even that, he refused to go. How do we protect our generation? We're worried that he's spending down not only his retirement, but also the next generational retirement. And I think Dr. Nauer said it so well. I hadn't framed it that way before. Like the idea that financial harm is the driver of gambling disorder that leads to the biopsychosocial harm. It's interesting. You think about that, it makes sense. The first past, you start losing money, and then all the other damage comes after that. What do we say to our mom? You know, these are generational issues between first, second generation. There's issues of respect, issues of filial piety for a lot of Asian families. What do we actually do? We can't just confront them. Uh, what are we supposed to do? What can we do as children to make this better? We don't control his money. We don't even know what money and assets he has. A lot of some of the themes among Asian cultures, you don't share, at least in that generation, at least I don't know how much money my mother and father had growing up. And the idea that I would ask them, Dad, what's your bank account? What's the password to your uh, mutual funds? Absolutely would be viewed as disrespectful. So a lot of issues came up. All of this in the first hour. Do we give money to our dad when he asks? Do we give money to our mother when she asks? 
she's not gambling, she's enduring the damage from gambling disorder, what do we actually do? So that was it. I only saw them one time. And this is a perfect example where sometimes you may only get one opportunity to work with an Asian American family or a client, and you really got to get those messages in there. And the messages can't simply be, oh, go to Gammonon, because there really isn't one for Asian American families. Oh, go get a family therapist, because again, if the family won't go, what do you actually do? So the bulk of this time, this one hour I had with Mary and John, was really spent about educating them about the natural course of gambling disorder, educating them about the principles of codependency and boundaries, right? Educating them about how to help their mother in a Western way, which is really, again, talking with her about thoughts and feelings and emotions, some very interesting things that you wouldn't ever actually see. But again, unfortunately, they never came back. So that's one of the things we have to be mindful of. So with that introduction, we go all the way to the very beginning of definitions. So we have a lot of working definitions out there and scientific definitions. Again, Asian Pacific Islander, a person with origins in the, of the original peoples in the Far East, and includes all these different countries. And when I first started doing this work, I said, I did not understand. We're talking about 25, 30 different countries and races and ethnicities and more importantly culture and that's really why it gets so confusing when we see all the names and languages that are out there either in the print media the radio or just in the in the books or the uh, journals that we read asian american pacific islander asian american asian pacific american asian or pacific islander apida that's a new one i doubt people have heard of that one asian pacific islander desi american to include the uh, men and women from uh, india and so i actually got that from my um, my alma mater northwestern's medical school website so it's dizzying now all of these are quote acceptable terms that you see in the scientific literature or and when you're communicating and doing that work. So 5% of the United States population will meet, meet um, one of those areas, about 13% of California. Why this matters, I think, again, it isn't just simply using just one language. You've got to get more specific. Here in Minnesota, this is taken from um, an API research think tank. And again, about 4% of Minnesotans who could vote AAPI, right? But again, you all know your state better than I about how the very specific, the Hmong, the Laotian, Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, Korean, and Filipino. That is not just an Asian, that is seven different ethnic groups and different culture. My experience as a second generation Chinese American is nowhere the same as a second generation of Vietnamese American here in Minnesota or a first-generation Cambodian here in Minnesota. That's what's so fascinating and so difficult about this field. We can't lump everything into the same treatment, and yet we have to be given this task of how do we get all these people from all across the world to come in. So let me just start with things that I've learned over the last 20 years about, in general, some of these Asian American themes that are predominantly from the Chinese American experience. And the reason these come from that in California, that tends to be the largest ethnic group we work with. And it's also the group that I grew up with. So I, I took a lot of my own experiences and things I've learned uh, in my household and in my family and applying them to kind of the patients that I'm seeing to recognize that these themes work for the Chinese American folks that I see. It may not necessarily work for the Filipinos or Vietnamese, but it really is inherent on us to build out these things. So in California, again, the largest Asian groups are Chinese, Filipino, uh, Vietnamese, and Korean. So that tends to be kind of where we've been doing this. And I started this, and it goes all the way back. I don't know the original source. A Chinese proverb saying that gambling is acceptable as an activity in the culture. And in fact, a little gambling is soothing and relaxing and heavy gambling could affect your mental health. So it's one of these kind of traditions that we are passed down verbally to recognize that there are things in moderation that are healthy, but even just gambling to begin with is okay. Even introducing gambling to a young person is acceptable within the culture. So in no particular order, things that we've identified over the last 20 years, and this comes from our patients, this comes from working directly with community. This comes from taking some surveys, sure, and doing the scientific work. But there is no substitute, and that's one of my top key points, for working directly with the community and learning from the community. 
In the first few years I started doing this, when I started working with API community groups, I realized most of the best talks I had with them were them telling me what was going on and not me pontificating, you know, professorial, this is what's actually happening. So some of those cultural factors that drive gambling activity, they're not cultural factors that drive gambling addiction. They just drive the ability to get people in front of a casino or open up their wallets or be acceptable with doing it inside the home. The idea that gambling was an acceptable way to make money, you know, it was if you win money, you can then use that money versus some other cultures that view gambling as robbery with consent, right? Or that this is not good money or it's blood money that you want. You shouldn't really be spending that. Number two, the idea that, particularly for immigrants, the idea that, well, maybe my fate is sealed. And one way to know what my fate is going to be is that gambling is the window into the future. That by seeing what actually will happen if I win, maybe that's uh, a sign that I'm going to win uh, in life down the road. Honoring the gods is a really interesting one. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in the suburbs of Chicago, every spring we would go to the cemetery where my great grandfather and my grandfather and all that were buried, and we would offer up a sacrifice. And it would be, you know, incense and duck and food and drinks and all sorts of things like that. And growing up, it was always this idea, well, you have, always have to honor the ancestors and honors of God, not just keeping them in your mind, but actually giving real-world material possessions to them. Because I always, when we left that cemetery, I said, why are we leaving the duck there? I said, well, don't we get to eat that? And my parents were like, no, that's for your great-grandfather. And that's a sacrifice. And you can imagine if you're coming from a working class and giving away things, that's a big dent on you financially. So the idea that gambling, if you lose, in some ways can be then rationalized, well, I'm giving this to the ancestors. This is for uh, the gods. It's my donation. Another way that, of making losses tolerable, uh, financial losses kind of being acceptable. And again, the idea about gambling and using that as a way of moving up classes. So imagine coming over to America, that's still one of the, the challenges. How do I get the American dream? Well, maybe if I win the lottery, or if I win the jackpot, or if I do well at the pag out poker, I can then actually move up from a middle class up to upper middle classes. So more cultural factors, uh, again, particularly in the Chinese culture that you would see, uh, emphasis on power of numbers over life events, right? Have you ever wondered why a lot of Chinese restaurants use the number eight, right? And of course, the number eight is seen as symmetrical and considered with good luck versus other numbers are equated with bad luck, right? Like the number three, number seven, things like that. But also, you just have lots of other peers that are gambling. Well, when when vast majority of your friends and family are gambling and that's a dominant social activity, of course, that's going to lead to more gambling. Gambling is a rite of passage. My father told me a story. When he was 12 or 13, then he was... Uh, forced to drink with the men, you know, and in also learn mahjong and play uh, games of chance for money. And if you didn't engage in that, you didn't become a man or you didn't become an adult. So gambling actually adds that rite of passage. And not only that, losing then as being a rite of passage there as well. So all these cultural factors promote gambling activity. But what really drives then gambling addiction? It's one thing to promote it and get people to accept it, but it's another thing that and actually be an actual risk factor. And I think one of the first things we look at, and this is true for all Asian Americans, is just the process of immigration in of itself, the experience, and whatever trauma is brought over and the stresses of immigrating to America in 2023. You know, I can't think of a more challenging country to come to, but also a more amazing country, right? And then we all know this, we see this, we recognize this in our, in our lives and our neighbors and in the stories that we see. Can you imagine coming from your country of origin, not speaking the language, being loosely familiar with the culture of America, believing that America is this open dream and you're right smack dab somewhere in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You don't know the language, you look around, you see some of your community, they speak the same language, you can't quite access benefits, and you look up and what do you see that's open there? Casinos, lottery, $1.9 billion, you know, uh, you know, jackpots, things like that. Sports betting, you turn on the TV, you see people winning money. But we forget about these three areas, and this is really interesting. If you're working with anyone who's on the immigration side, really screening and talking about what these three issues, loss, loneliness, and status-seeking really being primary factors in the acculturation 
phase that leads to gambling addiction, gambling disorder. So inside that phase, I don't think we do that enough, really talking to people and say, well, what has it been like for you and your family to come to America? How difficult has that acculturation process been? And what has that done to you mentally, financially, and in this case, where does gambling fit into that story? Now, what about the gambling industry driving and taking advantage of some of these things, right? And I'll use that word advantage. We all know about this. Do they have it? I'm sure they do. Susan, the gambling buses here in Minnesota that pick people up from various parts of Minnesota and take them to the casinos. How many of them are actually centered in Asian communities and centered? I'm sure there's a few. So we've known about this for 20 years. And here's a image of what these would look like. And this is obviously not from California because people are wearing winter jackets. But throughout America, we see this story. And the question is, well, who's responsible? Is it the casino? Partly. Is it tour bus operators that use this as an actual business? Yes. Is it the demand from the community that says, we want these buses? And again, for those un unfamiliar, these are buses that are either very cheap or free, where clients can get on, get driven to the casino, and at the end of that trip, they either get a voucher for playing in the casino or food, or frankly, they just get a free ride on a nice bus. And we actually did a study where we went on some of these buses in Los Angeles and surveyed folks, got a sense of what the gambling addiction rate, and it was pretty high, it was about 15, 20%. But furthermore, tried to understand, why are you riding this bus? And so often we'd get the return because it's fun, it's something to do, I get a free meal because my best friends are doing it, my community is doing it, and you also heard, well, what else are we going to do? What else is there for us to do? In language services, Asian entertainment on the bus, Asian entertainment when they get to the casino. So we've created this world where the whole point of gambling recreationally is to connect people together. That's what this is doing, but at the same time, it's also creating vulnerability um, by Again, driving people to the casino on a very, very frequent basis. This is seven days a week, multiple times throughout the day. This isn't just a random occurrence. So let's go back over the 20 years of what we know. So Nancy Petrie was the uh, pioneer in gambling treatment research. And this is really where it all started to try and bring these linkages from science to figure out what actually is happening. So this is now almost 20 years ago. This was in Connecticut. Um, I, where are my Connecticut folks back there? So we know that, surprisingly, there is a Cambodian, Laotian, Vietnamese refugees in Connecticut, and she just surveyed 100 that are coming through a community-based organization there, and there, in a shocking number, 60% of this 96 people developed or met criteria for, at that time, pathological gambling. 60%, or in other words, 30 times the national average. That's a massive epidemic. That's a crisis, right? So I remember talking with her about this back in 2002, and she said, I couldn't believe the data. It didn't make sense. We had to go back and redo it. And the same number came out over and over. And you would think with that, that this would launch an investigation. This would get the news. People are very excited. But when you have the dual combination of people aren't excited about gambling addiction combined with Asian American mental health not being a front page New York Times kind of issue, this is the kind of thing that unfortunately got buried for a long time. But it began the discussion. It began the discussion of saying, well, what is happening? Are Asian American Pacific Islanders at greater risk for gambling disorder? And if they are, what are we doing about it in the community? What are the casino operators doing about it? And furthermore, what can we do to actually prevent that? So that early recognition, I'll call it now almost that first decade after 2000, is that we know that there are communities in Asian American communities, and it turned out that no matter where you go in America, those Asian American communities, San Francisco Chinatown, Philadelphia Chinatown, Chicago Chinatown, parts in LA that were predominantly Asian American, did have elevated rates of gambling disorder compared to epidemiologic study. Okay. So now what do we do about that? So started to get more, this is 20 years ago, more and more PSAs that are specific to the AAPI communities. Well, but how much are PSAs actually gonna change behaviors? Some, maybe, who knows, but it's a start. Then we needed to figure out where we're gonna get funding, and throughout the last 20 years, surprisingly, it hasn't changed that much. Burst 
little boluses of funding to do the work, and then the funding goes away. So when the funding goes away, what happens? The work goes away. So then it's a real constant issue where battle where you had AAPI community groups getting a taste of a little bit of funding. They do the education prevention, but then the funding isn't sustainable. So what do we know then over the last 10 years then is that more and more states get funding treatment for gambling disorders. So that's great, right? Something like what, over 30, 35 states now have state-funded treatment for gambling disorder. And inside those funding, then are there dedicated funds for gambling treatment for Asian Americans? Some. But again, same thing. It's a workforce capacity issue. What good is it if you have funding for treatment, but you don't have culturally relevant or culturally connected therapists? I think that's part of the struggle, and that's certainly the theme of why we're doing this today, to elevate the story for the Asians here in Minnesota. So here are the issues right now, 2023, when it comes to Asian American and gambling. Number one, demand for gambling has returned full on since the pandemic, right? That's true domestically, we know that. That's true across the board of all our cultures and ethnicity in America. But what about international visitors? So I don't have those numbers on the tip of my uh, numbers, but again, that's the real question to say. Well, are we getting, in our state, visitors from international countries who come to our state to go to our casinos? So is that a big thing, Susan? Do you get a lot of international visitors coming to Minnesota to gamble in Minnesota? Is that a destination? <laughs> Probably not, but it's, so it is something more nationally. Obviously, Vegas and a little bit of Atlantic City, but mainly Vegas is an area where we think about those Asian Americans, those Asians that are coming into uh, America. And number two, we know that Asian marketing, and I'll put that in quotes, and these are casinos with the billboards, the buses, the Asian food buffets, the Asian entertainers, then having dedicated Asian marketing departments still operate heavily. And the real question is, how do we engage with that as advocates in the problem gambling field? We're not trying to shut them down. Do they have African American marketing divisions? No. Do they have Hispanic and Latin, Latino, Latinx marketing divisions? No. Do they have American Indian marketing divisions? No. Do they even have women marketing divisions, no. But they have Asian marketing divisions. So again, it's a new area and wrinkle to really, I think, encourage us to sit down with those operators and say, how come you have this? And if you do, why are you pinpointing a specific community? And, and even more so, what are you doing to protect that community? So lastly, this idea then, we have very, very little data on the impact of this growing online gambling space and what impacts that has on Asian American communities. Essentially almost no data, essentially almost no, nothing from the communities themselves seeing this is what we're getting. But again, kind of you saw it in Leah's um, thing, mainly younger, mainly Gen Z's and millennials, but even then, now we're in the AA, what about the AAPI community who are millennial and Gen Z? Do those same themes of gambling that drove the first, second uh, generation of Asian Americans to casino still exist in those. In other words, my kids, our kids, our kids are 17 and 13, so now they're technically, you know, the third generation. Uh, actually, yeah, because I'm second generation, they're third generation Asian American. And I asked my uh, oldest son who's starting college this week, I said, um, how do you identify culturally? He's like, what do you mean? I'm just me. I said, what, are, you, are you more Chinese or more Filipino? He's like, I'm from Los Angeles, Dad. <laughs> he doesn't really talk like that, but, you know, he's, 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 he's Gen Z. So it's really interesting. He doesn't really identify, but we do have a lot of Asian cultural themes. You know, he wears Manny Pacquiao shirts. He gets red envelopes and like, uh, Lunar New Year. But those themes that were instilled by my father that were very, very Chinese-oriented are a little bit different. So... Again, that's a real interest is what kind of vulnerabilities will the online market have for Asian communities. And that's really an unexplored area, and we need to do a lot more. So with that, we have to think about, okay, what are we actually doing here uh, in terms of data? We have prevalence in California. This is our last statewide survey done nearly 17 years ago that had a very low response rate of Asian uh, respondents to those surveys. We know this is a problem. There it established about almost 
Uh, Three percent of our Asians in California met criteria for some harm related to gambling disorder, which was right around the same, a little bit lower than the number for non-Asian Americans. But again, people are like, well, this was done in English, low response rates, doesn't capture folks who are um, immigration first generation. We did a survey, this is now about 12 years old, where we went inside the actual casino. And we sat there for four days straight. Well, I didn't. I set the volunteers and the research students to do that. And they we just generated some random, you know, walk by the table, get some surveys. The first thing we found was that 40% of people inside the casino identified themselves as AAPI. 40%, much higher than the 15% of the state of California. And this was a casino that was not in an Asian community. It was about 30 minutes south of downtown LA. Um, so it was just fascinating to see that. But even more so, regardless of whether you were identified as uh, API or non-API, your gambling disorder risk was about 35% or higher. So in other words, yeah, we figured this would be true, about 30, 35% of people walking in around inside the casino have any gambling disorder. But 40% of those people were AAPI. And even more so, one of the unfortunate things we realized, much of those folks with AAPI who identified AAPI were a lot less likely to go to treatment or be willing to go to treatment for gambling. We replicated that in San Jose about 10 years ago. We went to a person on the street sort of thing and just randomly asked people in San Jose about uh, their gambling activities. So it a, gives you a flavor of what's actually happening in the streets. And there, again, general population identified in the city of San Jose, about 3.8% having some problem related to gambling behaviors, 4.1 for the Asian Americans in San Jose, but the Asian Americans in San Jose identify, yes, this is much harder for me to talk about. No, I don't want to talk about this problem to anybody that I don't know. The barriers to treatment that the Asian uh, identified that, uh, were greater than the non-Asians. I don't have any money to go. And even if I did, I don't want to talk to anybody. And the shame attached with losing money was measured as greater than non-APIs. And lastly, even for the ones who did say that we would, I have no idea where to go at all. So again, you're dealing with things that make sense in every community. If you don't have resources, they're not going to go. If they don't know where to go, they're not going to go. If you don't have resources in their language, they're not going to go. And if lastly, if they don't want to go because they don't see value in going because of all the barriers attached to seeking help for mental health, they're not going to go. Whew, you talk about a challenging area to get into. So if you were in charge of a clinic or a clinic or a corporation or a nonprofit, and you say, we got to get 100 people for services. How are you going to get them to show up in your front door? And that's what we're going to talk about. But the irony in the San Jose study was that folks did know that gambling disorder is an addiction. It's not just an issue of morality or lack of willpower. Like, yeah, no, we know it's an addictive behavior. But most people just didn't know where to go. Not API or API. And again, this is about 12 years ago. I don't think change, things have changed you know, dramatically um, since then. All right. Serena King, is she here? I was hoping she'd be here. She is University of Minnesota, and she's done a lot of tremendous work on APIs and gambling here in your fair state. So I had to quote this from her work done during the pandemic, looking at problem gambling risk factors, community knowledge, and the impact in a Minnesotan Laotian immigrant and refugee community sample. So that's what she did. She went into the uh, community, and this was probably, what, four or five years ago now, and similarly just used the South Oaks gambling screen, but also tried to get more additional information about their attitudes and thoughts and behavior related to gambling. So it makes sense for the folks who did have those endorsed gambling problems, why were they gambling, making money? Socialization, entertainment, reducing boredom, things that, yes, are classically recognized in all gamblers, but particularly in Asian gamblers that are in tight-knit community, making us realize we need to offer more options. We need to do education to recognize that gambling is not a sustainable way of making money, that gambling should not be your dominant form of entertainment, that gambling should not be your 
dominant form of reducing boredom. This is the modern day society with your phones, right? And yet 35% of people are saying, yeah, this is a great way to relieve boredom. So I think that's a good example of using the community and understanding what they're actually saying to you. Less commonly reasons depression or escape, which is real interesting, because one would have thought, oh, with this immigrant um, you know, sample, that they're gonna be very stressed and a lot of trauma, that they're gonna be driving to gambling to take away their emotional pain. Surprisingly, that was a much smaller, but not zero. So that's why the work has to happen, but recognizing that it's the other activities are, are much more common and likely. Another uh, voice from Boston, and they've done tremendous work in uh, Boston Chinatown, and this is an executive uh, paper that talked about the community voices. So really getting the voices from the men and women who lived in Boston Chinatown, and really said, well, what are they saying? What are they asking for? What do they want versus what do they need? And this was done pre-pandemic, and I'll distill it down to their executive summary. You can, you can get it online. But they did describe very simply that the people of Boston Chinatown described varying degrees of dependency on gambling uh, in the casino to relieve the drudgery of work in low paying jobs in the food service industry. In other words, the folks that worked in the Chinese restaurants that we all love. And we forget how stressful that is, how monotonous that is, how busy that can be, and how gambling then is turned to relieve the strain I call it moral injury, right? That's the term we're using in healthcare now, the pre-burnout. It's just the moral injury. And then also the isolation of life in linguistically isolated neighborhoods with few alternative opportunities for recreation. Boston Chinatown, if you ever been there, big city Chinatown, small, just like any other Chinatown in America, right? But you, that's the phrase, linguistically isolated neighborhoods. I don't think they have a lot of open spaces there. I don't think they got a lot of restaurants and bars that are available, affordable for folks. I don't think they have a lot of other new types of recreation that are housed in there because it's such a dense community. So that's exactly what the voices were saying. They were saying, we have a tight-knit community, we have our daily day routines, but gambling becomes part of that routine when you have the buses when you have the community themselves promoting that, when the restaurant workers talk about during their time off that they're gambling for money in the illegal gambling dens that are inside that restaurant in of itself, kind of a closed system. All right, so what do we actually do? So we think about this on treatment. So I want you to think about if you actually are starting to see clients or you're working with the community, what number one are the barriers to overcome and address that you don't traditionally see in non-AAPI clients? Well, number one, language is a big one. So doing this in language is really challenging. Now we have more technology to do this, right? AT&T operating services on our phone, Google Translate, but still I don't think we have a great in-person translated abilities yet. And even on telehealth, I'm not aware of a seamless telehealth translated system. I think that's where we ought to be, where you have a telehealth hookup, you have the client, and you have a third window that's really seamless. But if you have that, recognize that translation takes time, it's slower, it, it can be expensive, and it's a huge, huge barrier. So even just a phrase like urge or craving, trigger, these are all things that require time to explain in language as concept. And number two, uh, generational consideration. I think, again, uh, this idea from first, second, first generation, second, third, fourth, different levels of, of whether or not people are willing to come in or you know, address mental health. So our generation, um, Generation X, definitely more willing. Millennial, Gen Z, they almost expect mental health to be embedded in everything that they do. But again, when you still have multiple generations coming through, uh, I think that's still a barrier we have to overcome. The cultural biases, of course, for us as providers, not getting the full adequate training, meaning we have to continue to figure out how to get more of that training uh, in our very busy schedules, and particularly uh, not being afraid to, and I'll, I'll do this a lot with some from folks, I'll say, listen, um, we come from very different backgrounds. Take me a few minutes, tell me about your culture. Tell me about your values, your family. What are the lessons you learned growing up? And these are not questions of getting symptoms and signs. I'm just learning about them as a person. That takes time. And for some 
patients I can say, they were like, well, you know, why do you want to know about my family or where I come from? Don't you want to know about my depression or about my gambling behavior? Don't you want to just write me a prescription and send me on my way? It can be a little bit off-putting, right? So I think it's important for us to explain why we are asking for that information. And of course, in the Asian American communities, there's just such a danger of labeling all Asian Americans under this model minority myth that's persisted now for 50, 60 years. Clearly, we've seen this myth debunked that it doesn't always happen in every single Asian communities and that the high education um, uh, and this again, that's not why it's a myth. So you, have, you make a lot of assumptions there that way to um, reverse against. The other things about APIs that enter gambling treatment and some of the barriers that happen inside treatment that might prevent them from coming back or might prevent them from telling you the full story and being completely open and honest or minimizing a lot of these things. So all these sorts of things I listed here from a few, a few articles I think were really interesting that highlight some areas again about uh, minimizing losses, about the idea of, of shame and still holding on to values of beliefs in fate and luck that inside therapy you have to start to think about, am I going to challenge that? Am I going to tell them that that superstition is just not based in mathematical reality? How are they going to deal with that? So my approach on, on that is to really engage and say, well, where a little bit of a CBT model, where are you getting that evidence? And how can we use your beliefs in fate or in luck or superstition to promote healthy recovery? And it's interesting where it comes back sometimes around where I've had a lot of folks say, well, I've just been lucky to get an appointment with you. Or, you know what, it's just fate that brought us together to actually meet. And to me, it's like, no, you actually made a phone call, and no, it was my scheduler that actually put you in front of me. But I've come to learn to say, you know, don't diminish that and embrace that. Say, you know what, perhaps you're right. And together on this journey, this is where let's use our strength of fate and luck together to have a much uh, healthier outcome. So other issues, family, socialization has been passed on to this idea that family um, is, is the unit and that oftentimes the whole family will hide and minimize the losses. Oftentimes, and when I was growing up, uh, there was this theme of do not air your, quote, dirty laundry with others. So in other words, don't tell people who aren't inside the family about our problems. And so that's something that even can happen inside therapy because you're not a family member. So oftentimes there may be uh, a, a point to really just not say how, how, how much distress you're really going under. So how do we conquer some of these barriers? What are some of these uh, antidotes to stigma? And you think about the stigma and the shame of coming into treatment, of talking about um, financial losses to a stranger, to a stranger who is not of their own culture. And again, it starts with, of course, education and empathy. We're preaching to the choir when we think about that, but I'm sure there's times when even ourselves don't have that in ourselves, and that's where we have to go back and really say how we're gonna expand this. And so some of the best practices that we know about reducing stigma uh, and really that language barrier and really saying, well, how do I figure out how to break that down? Does that mean instead of scheduling for 30 minutes, I had to schedule for 45 minutes? If I had to then arrange and spend a little extra money on the clinic's time to get in language services, I think that's really where we have to figure this out. I think technology is very close, where we can have seamless um, translation abilities, where we can speak into the phone and outcomes the actual, in your own voice, in real time, the language that uh, they speak in. We're close, we're not quite there yet, but I think in a few years we'll have that ability to break down that. Number two, again, talking about traditional beliefs and values that they hold about health and illness and mental health and recovery. So instead of saying, oh, I believe recovery is this and this and this, or you really need to do this and this and this, real understanding, well, in your culture, in your community, how do people get better quality of lives? How do they get improved? And I think that's certainly one part of empowering folks. Number two, number three, getting to active participation in care. We see a lot of Asian clients really like physical somatic treatments acupuncture, massage, uh, incense, um, and this is where, as a physician, even just the act of doing things like taking their blood pressure, 
giving medications, doing physician-related things, instilled a sense of something's happening to me, and now this I'm, I'm definitely willing to come back. For instance, in Korean communities in LA, there's a lot of injections of vitamin B12 injections, even though there's no medical reason for that. Uh, but doctors will do it because they say, well, that way I can get them to come back, and then we can look at other health issues along the way. Involving the family as a treatment unit can be unsettling for a lot of providers that are not used to having two or three members inside the Zoom or inside your office on session one. So there's a number of patients I work with where it's one person on the medical chart, but every session there's three or four people in the room. So we're really working together as a family unit on this. And lastly, this idea, again, that we use from medications of ethnopsychopharmacology. Again, I highlighted that where sometimes uh, a lot of Asian clients feel really strong about taking uh, medications of certain colors, actually, like red pills are better than blue pills, that actually promote uh, engagement and care. How is that relevant for you there, again, is going back and, uh, and identifying what would help, what helps in your worldview to promote strength and recovery. Now, growing up, you know, whenever I had a cold or ever had some aches, you know, my family would do a lot of traditional Chinese med medicine and offer up, you know, herbal teas and various potions that came in unlabeled bottles and various muscle rubs that my dad would say, this is good for you and don't ask what's in it. But it was all driven by a firm belief that the power of traditional Chinese medicine would convey a lot of good things. It's the same thing here, and that's where in your agency to say, well, how do we combine forces with traditional Asian medicines like that? So I have a few minutes, and I want to open up some questions, but first, here's what we do in California. Uh, we're really lucky to have in California a statewide treatment program. We get about $4 million a year to provide for care for gambling disorder uh, clients and their families. That sounds like a lot, right? $4 million? But it was $4 million in 2009, so it's exactly flat, and trying to get that to go up is a, a certain challenge. But we have everything from soup to nuts. We have a uh, telephone helpline. Thank you, TELUS Healthcare. They're in the room here, 1-800-GAMBLER. That gets telephone counseling in languages. Uh, and then, of course, we have over 150 licensed therapists that provide care. We have intensive outpatient program, and we have residential treatment. So. We're fortunate to have everything there. We want more, though. And of the folks that enter treatment, about 17% come in, identify themselves as APIs. So that's a little bit higher than expected. Uh, we also know that we know um, um, we have a little bit more API providers than to expect there as well. And similarly, we know that our outpatient demographics, uh, that most of the folks, again, the API, I didn't show it, are predominantly from the Chinese. Korean, Filipino, and Vietnamese cultures. We have uh, available, and you can find this for you in Minnesota, a self-help workbook we made over 10 years ago that still holds up. A just very short 30-page PDF. You can email uh, Freedom From Problem Gambling where folks can go through exercises and think about their gambling and kind of inspire themselves to do it at no cost. But the key is that we have it printed in a lot of different languages, including Cambodian, Laotian, Korean, uh, Tagalog, uh, Chinese, and things like that. So that's available on our, our website. That's available on the state website. That's an easy, easy task to have uh, in your community centers or to email out to uh, folks. And you can imagine having printed copies like that housed inside Asian American churches or community centers or just the buses that are on the casinos, you know, leaving material around for people to see. Okay. Oh, Jay Robinson is, he's logging on. He'll be here in a sec. So the other ideas that I have here are some prevention. Really, again, thinking about if you're doing prevention work, uh, and this works for all sorts of gambling, I think particularly though, but think about the next generation of Asian American young people, talking to them about uh, teaching the odds, the coping skills, uh, demystifying gambling as a sport, as a recreational activity to make money. I'll talk more about that in our sports talk later. Focus on the family, uh, and this again, working with the patient's family together in one single room, and really encouraging communication. And this is where you're going to say, well, how do I do all these release of information? How do I do all the confidentiality? And that's why oftentimes I'll say in the very beginning, who is the patient officially 
then during that family session, make sure that everyone understands uh, the flow of information, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. A few things about what clinicians can do. Again, language service availability via telehealth or in person. Number two, pull away from standard extensive questionings with uh, do you or should you or what do you, you know, that are very directive, much more open-ended. Help develop short-term tangible goals that people can identify. And again, some of that somatic approaches that combine Eastern philosophies. GAs are really pivotal part, but when it comes to AAPI and GAs, how many in-language GA meetings are available in Minnesota? I imagine there may be a couple. But thankfully, with gamblinginrecover.com, we do have more in-language meetings throughout the world. But well, one of the things that we know is that uh, oftentimes it can be very difficult for first or even second generation Asian clients to go to a room or log on to a room of strangers, again, airing, you quote, your dirty laundry. So oftentimes I'll, I'll encourage any Asian clients to say, listen, you're going to go there for fellowship and support, but I really hope you can find an individual sponsor even before you start going to the meeting. So I think that's where if you find you have champions uh, to get people to meetings, that's helpful. And, and applying and adding in Eastern treatment options there as well. Acupuncture, cupping, massages, using Eastern philosophies of energy and balance and restorations. So that means, again, of course, partnering with communities, bringing those folks and experts into your community or you going into their communities and working together. And here's a story of, a, of an action that a community agency did to address Asian and problem gambling. This comes from Philadelphia, where an artist created a mural of gambling imagery that included aspects of luck, fate, problem gambling, what happens when new casinos are embedded in your local area, to create a message of hope and restoration. And here's what it is. It's called Fables of Fortune. Has anyone seen this? Anyone been in Philadelphia? It's located in the Chinatown itself. It was paid for by the community agency to say, where are we going to put our dollars in to the community? So instead of a billboard on the freeway that was going to vanish, they decided to put it on the side of a building. And if you look at this image, and you'll see the imagery of the money, you'll see images of connection, you see there's a part here that says, I need help. So it's a really interesting idea that's embedding in the community for open discussion. What they don't put on there was a helpline number. What they don't put on there was a website. So it was deliberate because it was the idea to foster discussion, to get people talking, and then to get community agencies to use the mural when talking with folks and say, hey, have you noticed our mural? What do you think of that? And that was a way of getting people talking about that. So I have a roadmap of things I'd encourage any community or state to think about. And I think about here in Minnesota what you all could be doing or maybe already doing when it comes to Asian gambling issues. Number one, really partnering with those casino buses, getting on the bus itself, doing the education on the buses, talking with communities, doing the screenings on the bus, if you can get on the bus. Number two, developing, of course, and using those online tools and apps that are going to be culturally relevant. Uh, I don't have any at the top of my uh, uh, of mind right now, but developing your own locally is always great. Uh, working with some of those local uh, API dining establishments about, well, maybe it's time for us to do education of the workers or have some sort of uh, gambling screening a day here at the restaurant or embed health and wellness screening here at the uh, Asian restaurants. Uh, Asian churches tend to be a real vital source for a lot of information. And unfortunately, in LA, we had a number of Asian churches that continued to promote gambling as an activity for fundraising or gambling trips as the, the big trip for the church. And I think that's an area. But we also had a number of pastors that, were, uh, uh, that came to us originally saying, we have a lot of men and women with gambling issues, and we oftentimes don't know what to say to them other than to come to church more often. So I think that's a perfect example of partnering with the church to say, hey, well, pastors, priests, nuns, uh, mentors, deacons, these are the folks that should also be getting gambling tr um, training uh, 101. 
the warning networks, again, the bankruptcies, uh, arrests, the violence, those are the things that we want to be aware about. Part of the reason we got into this uh, arena is in Asian American stories is that about 15 years ago, 20 years ago actually now, there are a number of very high profile deaths in LA related to Asian American gambling. There were some murders, there were some suicides, there were some really horrible things that happened. And so the community was saying, hey, these things are happening. We don't like this, please help us. And they were all traced back, unfortunately, to gambling services. All right, so that's right on time. A couple minutes for questions. I'll be back after lunch to talk about sports and warm it up for Brian Hatch and uh, Jeffrey Wasserman. But this is the Asian portion, uh, a couple of things. Our website for our, our program at UCLA, you get lots of information and you can get the uh, workbook there. And then that's my UCLA cell for any questions, uh, comments, and things like that. One of the things that's been amazing about telehealth is that we can now do consultations across state lines. So until someone tells me no, if you have a family or an individual that wants consultation on how to help their gambling, we can see them and have their health insurance pay for it. So until I get shut down by the medical board or by the feds, we're still going to do that. So there is some movement now saying, yes, if you're going to provide care to someone, it should be in person, but it's not yet a mandate. So I still think that's an important thing we can do is to bring specialists across state lines to provide that. So I think that's an area I still offer. Uh, and as long as, again, health insurance are paying for that, that's something we can do. All right, time for a cute few questions and then a short minute break. And then we have Jay Robinson logging in from Nova Scotia. So Excellent. Susan's got the mic. <laughs> Please ask on the mic and tell me your name and who you are and what you do. Well, first of all, thank you, thank Jim, you Susan. for this great presentation. Hi, my name is uh, Dan Johnson, and I'm a fill-in counselor at the Fairview Gambling Addiction Program. Um, and I work as a chemical dependency counselor also. Um, you brought up the kind of the rite of passage stuff, the how culturally uh, intertwined gambling is with, with growing up. Um, I appreciate that you shared some of the cultural things that can be done at the, the end here. Um, the, the bringing up, uh, um, get a sponsor before you go to your first meeting. Are you having success with that where, where your clients are actually doing that? A few, and, and we're fortunate in California where we have a lot of resources. We have a large network. So uh, there a number of folks from Gamblers Anonymous have said yes. Anytime you have a client who have questions about GA, or want to know about GA, they can call me. And that has been an incredibly valuable service for me. Because I, as a clinician, if I just say, hey, go to a GA meeting, and they're like, well, why? And which ones? I don't know what happens inside the room. I don't know what the themes are or the milieu are. So, and this is just something we've built over through years of doing this, where we have a network of very open men and women who are willing to do this. And, and, and that, I think, is really, really valuable. So they've already said this. We have no problem talking to anyone. I will give them, them the client that person's number. So it works best, uh, honestly, for uh, a lot of women gamblers that I see. They're like, no, I'm afraid to go to a GA meeting because I hear it's all men, I, I don't wanna, and we don't have a lot of female-only meetings. But instead, I have like three or four women in GA or in recovery that say I am absolutely willing to talk to that person. Now, from a therapist standpoint, there's always a little bit element of risk. You say, well, wait a minute, I'm now referring my patient to a non-licensed provider or just to another citizen. And I recognize that. At the same time, I've gotten to know that person on the other end who's willing, so I don't just give them a number to a person I've never met. So it's really building up that connection with folks who, in GA who've been willing to share that. And I think that's, that's so true for so many GA members. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie. I am a mental health case manager, but I'm thinking more on the lines of the young people that um, whatever the generation right now is, I have a couple of them, but I can't keep it all straight. Um, but social media and reality television and that 
all of this stuff is so glamorized and so simplified on whether it's reality television or TikTok um, influencers. How do you um, have any impact on those platforms for those people, those young people that are, you know, idolizing this kind of behavior and simplifying it? So we'll have more for that in the sports betting segment. Um, and that is, I think, a super critical thing. So things that uh, we're doing in California include, number one, for the young people, we have a whole group called Friday Night Live. Uh, it's a nonprofit, and they receive funding from the state. What they do is they empower the young people to make the messages. So in other words, they go into schools and they do this across like 20, 30 schools. Each school has about 10 to 20 young people and they charge the young people to make TikTok videos, to make um, PSAs, to make printed media ads. So the young people are then driving the conversation themselves about gambling. Now that doesn't reach the limits of like the top influencers, of course. But at least in California, that's the prevention work. It's to take you know a couple hundred young people who normally would have never have been exposed to the negatives of gambling per se, and encourage them to do it in a way that pushes it out. So it's a real interesting area. I think the one quick thing I'll say is that there's a, such a very confusing state on social media of like these virtual gambling influencers that are talking about it. Are they getting paid by the industry? Or are they just virtual influencers that view this as a way for me to get likes and clicks and for me, and they have no interest in the gambling world? That's a very different different area. So there's a few of these influencers, I'll talk about them in the sports betting, that that's all they do, they make picks. Oh, I, these are my top picks. And they have no connection to the gambling industry, but they just literally get eyeballs on their screen for, for obvious reasons. So. Um, that's a new area. So the counter argument is, well, you can't shut all these voices down. You can't get rid of them. But the real question is, how do we get our voices out, amplified and elevated? You know, and that's, that's a very, very difficult, difficult question. I think instead, when I work with the young people, and it starts with, again, what are your views on what gambling is and isn't? What do you think about it? And then too often, I'll say it over and over this afternoon, the young people come to our office, and they say that gambling is the solution. Gambling is the way out to spectacular success. They'll say, I have special skills because I am of the generation of special skills. You don't have special skills. And they had third part, which is really the biggest one. They have very little emotional reserve to deal with loss. You lose, you lose. Well, losing is intolerable to me as a 16-year-old. Why? And I'll say to them, you know, losing is part of life. Not for me. For some reason, I was taught that I was special and I have a special skill and that I deserve the ultimate prize. All I'm saying, and I'll say more this afternoon, those are the folks coming into our treatment program. So that's the messaging we have to work against. Is that spectacular success is the only way to be happy and that by having massive attention to you is the only way to be happy with yourself. Now that's a global statement. Global statement. I don't want to minimize that, but that's the themes that we're going to be working against this afternoon. All right. All right. That's enough. Time for a break. Time. For sure. Ten minutes. Jay Robinson's you're, you're, back. You're, I'm here all day. You're multi-talented, Tim. You're a moderator. You're a presenter. Thank you so much.